Hello, folks. Welcome to another episode of the Work Item Podcast. And today on the show, I have a wonderful guest, somebody that actually, I don't think we ever had anyone on the show that founded a game studio. Uh, Gennady Karol, welcome to the show. Uh, well, thanks for uh, thanks for allowing me the opportunity to speak and uh, share some things. And by the way, great uh, pronunciation there for for my name. It's uh, I think the first time I'm hearing it uh, spelled uh, pronounced correctly. Thank you. Uh, Eastern European roots. That's that's what I put that on. Originally Ukrainian myself. Yep. <laughs> we just talked about right before the show that we have very very uh, similar background and roots. Mm -hmm. What are the odds? What are the odds? Right. It's like exactly the same. But Gennady, tell us more about what you're up to these days. Well, uh, as usual, we are uh, heads down um, making video games. And this time we're making uh, an action RPG, uh, which we already kind of mentioned uh, in a few uh, tweets, I think. Some people mentioned, I think Thomas uh, primarily. And um, yeah, it's going well. It's extremely ambitious. It's our magnum opus, if you will. You know, it's uh, bigger and better than any of the Ori games uh, with a lot more again and uh yeah busy and uh trying to make it as good as it can be yeah bigger and better than ori games which you're jumping to really the next question that i had for you which is people that know your studio people that know you probably know that from ori which is uh one of the games that got like universally it's loved well received uh you know the reviews speak for it and you know myself and my wife are big fans as well Mm -hmm. What was the inspiration behind that game? Well, I mean, we we have to go on a, a little bit of a trip down the memory lane, like many, many years back, I think about 2000, uh, well, 12 or 13 years ago, actually. So that would be about 2010, 2011. Um, I think it's it's the time where XBLA was really big and it can be, became huge in games like uh, Limbo, you know, um, Braid, um, all of those um, kind of indie uh, titles came out, you know, Super Meat Boy as well. And uh, we just felt like we could probably have our own take on some of those things. We were always inspired by classics um, of the Nintendo era, you know, um, Castlevania, uh, also um, Metroid. And we, uh, we loved those, those, those pure classic designs. And also we, we always loved... Uh, storytelling and we always loved things like the lion king you know the uh, princess mononoke spirited away you know uh, a lot of miyazaki stuff just just beautiful animation uh, beautiful storytelling using allegory using uh, you know using um characters that aren't human uh, to tell human stories and to to deal with maybe bigger and deeper human themes to touch people and uh, i think we wanted to combine that you know those two things because you know nobody really or at least we've, we we're not aware of a, a really deep story that's told in that way in a uh, you know in a metroidvania and we felt like we could do something there and uh that's very long story short i guess um there's a lot of inspirations that, that happened over the years you know video games they're not like you know you don't just necessarily have it all like on paper uh, or you, you have it in your head and you put it on paper and that's it it's a constant living you know, thing that you, that you kind of evolve and grow and it's, it's, it's kind of has a life of its own and you just, you just iterate on it and iterate, iterate on it until it really becomes what it ultimately becomes. So there is a beauty and uh, mis mystery to the creative process as well. Um, and I think uh, that also takes, it's not just the inspiration that you put into the, the work. It's also the process itself by which you execute and iterate that gets you to the final destination, I guess. So it's, yeah, um, that's also quite, uh, has been quite a big, uh, I think, reason for why Ori became uh, what it became. What's interesting in what you just described is you're kind of breaking that misconception that, you know, anybody that creates art, be it a video game, be it something like a movie, needs to come in with, you know, from from absolute zero. And what you're calling out is that, like, actually, there's a lot of inspiration that exists in past art that things that were kind of figured out and you can build on top of those and create something completely new, a completely different immersive experience that kind of builds on a lot of the things that were done before. Yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And, uh, and I think, you know, ultimately, I mean, there's, there's this debate of how, 
like is everything derivative you know is everything derivative of something and you know you can always trace back everything to some you know play and then the play can be traced back to some uh rumor or some sort of myth that existed in some culture and then you know uh, it's it's really interesting i i think that um you know as as an artist you know people that want to build video games you know people like thomas the uh, partner that uh, you know, i founded the studio with and um it's about expressing yourself it's about getting something out of your system right so you, there is a life experience you go through and that life experience may be many different things it might be experiencing certain media that strongly affected you which happened to us it could also be you know dealing with difficult things or or hardships or losses or sicknesses or whoever you know ho however you deal with uh with things you you kind of live through that and those lived experiences become uh a part of you and then you you use self expression to then get it out of your system and and tell a story and touch other people and kind of like try to communicate that thing that you're feeling or or want to share with the world and, and and you put yourself into into the product that way a good product did come out of it but in just in this case is ori and Thank we you. kind of Hopefully. fast forward it yeah we, we fast forward to saying like look there's this big accomplishment that you and your studio have achieved now going a little bit back and thinking through the origin of your personal story with game development what got you interested in that well i i i always uh, I actually, you know, I come of a kind of a programmer and engineer by trait. Uh, you know, that's my official education. You know, I did the university thing, you know, master's degree, everything. Um, however, I didn't start with that. I always liked computer graphics. I think from the age of like 11. Um, and that was, you know, things like um, Star Wars, the episode one that came out. It was uh, Shrek later. Um, those are the movies that I remember that really kind of like inspired me. I wanted to do that. I was like, look, I want to know how they're doing all of this stuff. Like how are they rendering fire, water, animating these characters, telling these stories? How do they make them, you know, feel so human? Um, and then Star Wars was just really cool as a kid, you know, lasers and lightsabers. It's just something that, you know, you you appreciate, I guess. Um, so I, 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 I just... Um, I just started consuming anything I could find, you know, uh, and I didn't even have internet access back then. It was, you know, you had to go to a different city to an internet cafe and download a bunch of stuff um, to really like, you know, go on those websites uh, back then and download all of those tutorials. I'd get books, any books I could get my hands on um, to, to study, you know, uh, computer graphics. And um, ultimately I arrived at working at a feature film company on an anima animated feature here. And uh, but that was offline. That means it wasn't real time. But I always liked um, this this interactivity loop that you get. Like I want to create beautiful graphics, and I want to express myself visually in that sense. You know, visual effects, um, just generally visuals is, is a very strong thing that I that I really uh, am passionate about. But it's also about um, the interactivity of it, like making it instantaneous, right? And kind of like responsive and, and there is this closed loop that happens uh, between, you know, the player and the experience instead of a passive loop where you're just observing something and you're, you know, you're passively in, engaging in it. And also just the process of development when it's this interactive, you know, it's actually much faster in terms of actually getting results. Um, you don't have to wait for a render, you know, to happen for 12 hours before you have a shot done, uh, or you don't have to wait for a render you know, to preview your, your scene, you know, to see it in full quality. It's like, it's real time. So, so I think that appealed a lot more to me. I like iterating quickly. I like seeing results quickly and, and I like interactivity a lot. You know, there's something uh, beautiful in, uh, in an interactive experience and what you can do in that medium, I think is a lot more um, powerful in a way um, than uh, just a, you know, an offline story and not, you know, subtracting anything from beautiful, amazing films that were done. But I just really feel like um, an actively participating uh, player uh, engagement, I think that's um, that's a lot more uh, on a fundamental level. There's this, you know, it's bi-directional by nature, right? It's not one directional, like you're not feeding the player something, but you actually... Um, there's a there's a dialogue almost right there is like a dance happening and i and i find that uh that's very interesting
what stood out to me and what you just described is that there is an interesting interweaving in, interweaving of the technical side of things, which is being able to basically put what you think into code and the story, which is a very uncommon skill, right? Like you usually have folks that are either like somebody's very technical, they're very much into code, or somebody is like a narrative designer that does all the narrative. You're yeah. kind of combining the two of them, right? Like what, what's helping you be good at both? Well, I, I didn't necessarily build the the story for, for Ori. I think a lot of that is also the team and uh, ultimately Thomas, uh, which I think is definitely a lot more creative than I am. It is, you know, and has been doing a lot more of the creative work. But I do believe that I had my share of, you know, involvement in, uh, in a lot of the... Uh, um, the visual storytelling, the visuals themselves. And um, um, it's interesting what it is that is, I guess it's, it's the, um, for me, it's the fact that I came from developing tools. That's, that's why I started. I, I, I wasn't necessarily a programmer. Like I didn't grow up thinking like, okay, I want to be programming. You know, that was never my passion necessarily by itself. I always saw programming as means to a goal. It was never, like, okay, I want to just be the best programmer in the world just for the sake of it. It was always why, what, what does this help me achieve? And for me, programming has always been to better the lives of artists, to enable uh, things that that I couldn't do myself, right? So I started doing modeling, 3D modeling, and, and I dabbled in all of that stuff from a very young age. But the way things were in the industry, you know, we use Maya and and other uh, other you know tools back then, 3D Studio Max and and uh, you know everything that was around that, and I, I didn't really feel that um, the tools were done uh, on a level that you know allowed me to do what I wanted to do the most efficiently. You know I felt like the tools were not designed you know very well to be completely frank. They were not built by artists. They were built by maybe engineers. And I approached it as an artist. Like I was using these tools day and night. I wanted to do things with these tools. And then I started scripting, you know, like, okay, I can do this little script here and there to help me. Then I learned C++ and and and, and all of that. And I started actually building more, you know, serious tools. Um, and that's how I, you know, got into the CG Talk community. And that's where Thomas and I ultimately met in 2004, because I was posting about the tools that I've made. Uh, and Thomas would be one of the testers, you know, one of the artists that would to use those tools and give feedback and help me design them better and improve them. Um, so there's a lot of a really good collaboration from the get-go there. But yeah, I think it's maybe the fact that I um I always look at engineering as uh as a as a as means to an end, right? That uh, there's it, it's 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 highly satisfying. The process of engineering is highly, you know, stimulating and challenging, but ultimately which is why I probably am in these, you know, fields of computer graphics and real-time computer graphics video games is because I want to see how that engineering translates into something that has a big, maybe bigger meaning, if you will, like something that means something to to people, something that has to uh, do with art, right? Something that that is, that is um, I, you know, maybe we can use a fancy word, you know, transcendent, you know, something that is hard to explain, but you kind of feel it, you know, you know what I'm talking about. It's this you know, you're communicating something um, and it's not just numbers on the screen, you know, like, cool, like you could be programming a lot of things, but I think video games specifically, they allow you to to make something really, really special. Uh, and uh, combining the two is, I guess, why I'm here is that that I can express my uh, engineering chops, you know, which is probably what I have talent for, that a God-given talent for being able to engineer things really well and solve difficult problems but also um, help build um, audiovisual experiences that are um, exceptional. And I think that's, I'm very lucky, I'm honestly very lucky to be able to do that. And it's also an interesting take uh, where you just talked about is using engineering as a means to an end. And again, it's a very uncommon opinion because folks get into these modes of you know, there is this joke about, you know, folks defending like which language you should choose or which framework. And, and at the end of the day, from what I'm hearing from you, right, it's like as long as it works for what you're trying to do, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it goes really deep. I mean, yes, ultimately, I think you're right. Like when a gamer is sitting there with a controller in front of the screen, they don't know what engine you use. They don't know if your function was 
the most organized in the world and your architecture of code was the most beautiful and the code was documented and that our assets were, you know, laid out in the most structured, structured way or, or whatever. Um, but I think there is the other aspect of it, which is, it's also not true that it doesn't matter at all. Right. Like, because, because, you know, if you need a bicycle to be able to go from A to B, and if your bicycle is broken or it's terrible to use, it's very hard to spin the pedals, you will be puffing and you'll not get very far. Or if you will get, you will, it will be very hard. So you want to have a better bicycle. So you have to find that balance where you do invest into good tools and processes. And it is extremely important to enable the artists and enable the creators to create. So, um, so it, it kind of doesn't matter, but it also does matter. So, you know, it depends on basically how you look at it. You also kind of alluded to the fact that, you know, you worked on Maya plugins, you worked uh, as a computer graphics engineer before you started the studio. And part of that, you mentioned that obviously you have the kind of the God-given talent to be able to solve these complex engineering problems because computer graphics and working with 3D models is not the easiest skill to pick up for anyone, no matter how talented. What helped you get your footing and actually be good at it? I guess a very good childhood where I didn't have to worry about anything. And I just, I mean, from the age of 12 until the age of 17, I probably just spent almost all of my time just reading every single book I can, playing with those engines and uh, and Maya and 3D Studio Max, learning it inside out building those models and animating those things and trying to build those sets. Like I just put in a lot of hours, which, you know, now looking back, it sounds insane to me that I would find the time these days. Cause you know, when you're grown up, it's, um, it's quite, uh, quite a lot more difficult, but I think it's, it's just putting the hours and having a drive and a passion for it. You know, I just, for some reason, I was just obsessed with this stuff. You know, I was just, this is what I would do. And my parents didn't quite know what to do with that, but they knew it was probably better than I would go and do some silly things with other kids, right? Like I would, I would, um, I don't know, rob a bank or I don't know, um, smoke, smoke something. Who knows what these kids do these days, right? But, but I wasn't interested in any of that. I was just, um, I was just really passionate about, I want to understand this. I want to figure out how this is done. I want to really get to the bottom of it and be able to do it myself. Um, so I think it's it's uh, it's repetition. It's 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 putting your 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 uh, it's showing up and putting in the hours, but also having a strong drive towards that thing. You know, it's it's kind of like at that point in my life, I knew that was what I wanted. You know, it wasn't like a you know it wasn't a vague thing. It wasn't a maybe. It was like I was obsessed. You know, I was in love with that thing. That that's all I wanted. I was craving new books. You know, whenever a new book would arrive. I would, um, you know, it's like Christmas for me, you know, I would, I would, you know, or whenever I would go to the internet cafe, when it would drive four or five hours to a different city, you know, I was born in Lviv, but we were living in, um, in a city next to Belarus back in the day. And there was no internet there back in the day. And I think dial up internet could barely even download images back, back in the day. And I needed videos, you know, I would go into Nauman workshop and high end 3d and all of those cool websites back in the day that dealt with, uh, you know, CG talk, obviously. Um, and they dealt with, uh, with computer graphics. And I remember really looking forward to just like, it was like the, the biggest Christmas for me is just being able to access internet and just, and just get that information. You know, people don't appreciate these days, you know, kids growing up today, they don't appreciate that, that abundance of information that you can just like, they don't know what it feels like when there's no internet. It just, there, you, you can't do it. You know, you have to, save your money and time and expect it and plan what do you want to get because you only have this many hours and we would pull in all-nighters i remember uh, us and my dad we would go there and we would pull in all-nighters we would absolutely stay there for the entire night and just just surf the web and, and get everything so um yeah i think i think maybe maybe this played a part but obviously you know uh i i hope that uh, i've contributed something good to the team and to the project but obviously it's a team effort and there's a lot of people that made it possible. So I definitely don't see myself as, you know, the guy or, or, or Thomas, you know, the guy. We we founded the studio. We we hopefully uh, attract really good talent to help us build it. But ultimately, it's it's the people. It's the studio. It's, the, um, it's everybody. It's all the artists, all the designers, all the programmers, everybody that came together, bashed their heads against you know this thing you know and then and then uh, allowed it to become what it what it ultimately became but yes personally myself 
I guess I'm a computer graphics junkie from from a very young age. It, it sounds like it, especially because you're giving me flashbacks of again, kind of growing up in Eastern Europe and back in Moldova, and th this is exactly the same thing when uh, dial-up was basically like inaccessible to anyone. And right now, it's funny hearing people complain about the fact that like, oh, my internet is only like 300 megabytes a second. It's like we when we had DSL for the first time, it, like mind blown. It's just like, wait, what? My page actually loads in 10 seconds instead of 30? Yes, please. Um, but also you I probably spend... The noise. The noise right. that these things used to make, yeah. Yes. And you probably spend your time way better than internet cafes because I remember going with my friends back in school and we would play like Counter-Strike and Lineage. Oh, I, and I did my share of that too. On Real Tournament, there was a lot on of Real that. On Real Tournament, yes. Yeah, we did a lot of that too. Yeah, I did that too, but I guess that was that was uh, a different one. That was like a network game cafe, uh, at least in Lviv. That's what they used to have. But uh, I don't think we we had uh, that was a specific like internet cafe. They served food there, I think, and they had like a party next to it. So I just for some reason I just remember very loud music while I was downloading stuff, and I didn't care. I just I was I was absolutely like in a different world. I was completely um, you know obsessed with that material I could get and you know, downloading these videos and everything. I was like, this is crazy. This is awesome. You know, I just download everything I could. Uh, and I think we, we used to then burn it on a CD. So there would be this process. You'd, you'd stand there and wait for 30 minutes for the CD to burn. Um, then you would take it at home and you'd be like, I better not break this or lose this. You know, this is so precious now. And these days it's like, it's always with you in your little little rock in your pocket that, that also has this that also happens to have a screen and 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 we kind of forgot you know how um, how lucky we are i guess to to have this technology these days and and to be able to to tap into this right so i think maybe in a way the scarcity of this resource maybe um, made it more um made it more precious to me maybe today people you know maybe there is so much information these days that it's hard to focus. It's hard to know what to to find, you know, where to spend your time. And we didn't have that problem back in the day. So I guess, you know, maybe maybe that's what's happening today is that you have so much of this information out there about game development and everything where you just don't quite know where to, you know, where to begin if you're getting into all of this stuff. Uh, saving pages to flash drives. That was my my jam of like the HTML, you know, I was like just hope all the images make it. Um, but let's talk about Moon Studios specifically because I think, you kind of talked about, you know, that it's all about the people at the end of the day, you know, any good product, it takes a village to ship a good product. You founded the company and did quite a bit of work there from the very beginning. What was the motivation for starting a studio? Because again, I kind of keep repeating this in the show, but your mental model around a lot of these things is different than kind of your common, I'd say like knowledge is of just like, oh, go work for some other company somewhere. You decided to found your own studio. Why was that? Well, it was kind of like one thing led to another and it felt really organic, you know, and we kind of did it gradually, right? So we didn't start with, hey, like we're here doing nothing. Let's just start a studio and hire 50 people. Obviously, you know, you'd also need funding for that. But, you know, we didn't even think that way. It was more like, you know, here we are. Thomas started working at, you know, we met much earlier in 2004, but I think towards 2008, Thomas was uh, wrapping up on StarCraft Two. And I was, I think, at the point where I kind of was seeing that the feature film that I was working on isn't going to get made. Um, and, you know, and I got a hint of that because the story was remade three or four times and the directors were fired three or four times. And the CGI department, the computer graphics department, was doing a really good job. We were, I think we were, we, we really had it um, handled. But the, this, this film wasn't just written well and it wasn't coming together and the investors weren't happy. So I was like, okay, this is probably, you know, num the days of this probably numbered. So um, I was just bored, honestly, and I was looking for um, just something to do. And Thomas at that point started dabbling with with uh, with uh, game engines. So I think it was Construct at first and then Unity. And uh, we just built a prototype. You know, he was finishing the work in StarCraft. I always loved first-person shooters. I always loved RTSs. And we were thinking about this mix called Warship. And there's still a video from 2010, I think, uh, where we made this prototype in Unity and we we showed it to the world. And it was just, um, you know, half something to do and, you know, just spend your time and uh, express yourself. But we were kind of seeing like, hey, this isn't too bad. This is, 
this is working. This is looking good. People like it. I think we got like 180,000 views in two days once we sh uh, shipped that video and it was, you know, no marketing uh, whatsoever. We've uh, hired a few people, you know, well, hired, quote unquote, the people joined the, you know, the, the studio um, with the, you know, the, the vision that we would be doing this. And uh, while we were signing the project, we were trying to sign this video, this uh, real-time first-person shooter, which probably isn't the wisest choice for your first-time project, you know, an online um, multiplayer uh, first-person shooter. Uh, we were like, look, we could probably dabble with some prototypes. And people really liked Super Meat Boy back in the day. And, and, uh, and they thought, hey, we could probably do something cool like that. And uh, that's how Project Sign, basically, that's how we called it internally, started. And uh, ultimately, we ended up pitching that uh, on top of the game while it was negotiating everything, the, the first-person shooter. And that's where Microsoft really picked it up. Um, and it supposedly should have been a project that should take six months, and we would learn from it, make some money. And it took four years and became Ori in the World of the Wisps. So long story short, these things take a bit longer than you think. Right. As, as it, you know, you start with the project that is like, it's going to be a prototype. And then all of a sudden it turns out like this blockbuster game that everyone wants to play. Yeah. Starting a studio, it seems like a, again, from my uninformed perspective, I've never started a studio. It's a very high risk, high reward kind of endeavor that you either, you know, you lose everything or you succeed massively. Did you have a backup plan when you kind of went down the path of starting Moon Studios of saying like, if things don't work out, then what I'm going to do next? No, I was incredibly foolish, I guess, uh, if we think rationally about it. But for some reason that is still not known to me today, I had full conviction that this is going to work out. I didn't know exactly to how, to what degree of like success this is going to work out, but I knew it would work out. And I, I think I even invested like three years of my salary like I didn't take anything from the company for like three years so we could reinvest it back into the project because obviously Microsoft wouldn't have invested, you know, a ginormous amount of money into this unknown studio that is also, by the way, remote. And, uh, you know, that wasn't the thing back in the day. And it was also all kinds of things, but that, you know, there were a bit, you know, if we really give Microsoft credit, you know, they took a pretty big leap on us, you know, because probably a fairly good chance we would have never succeeded and they, they invested anyway. Um, so yeah, so I think, I think I didn't really have a backup plan. In fact, I've invested everything I could have had probably from just, you know, the salary. So if we ended up making nothing on this game, you know, I would probably be three years of salary out and, uh, I'd have to figure out what's then. So not, a, not good investment advice, not good, uh, you know, career advice, I guess here, but this is what happened. And I just, for some reason, I just had this extremely strong conviction that that we have something here that that will work like we will be able to make this into something good and that people will like it uh, and at least we will you know recover our costs and maybe make a little bit of money to kind of be able to keep going um so yeah that was a very foolish perspective uh, ultimately it worked out so i could say hey you know i you know i had this amazing conviction but it easily could have not worked out right like it easily could have been a disaster for me um so i would i would definitely recommend these days if you are starting your own thing i would recommend people generally to invest early to find the company that they like learn about investing this is something i didn't know about you know and i only recently learned about this and i regret so much that i wasn't given this these tools to life earlier um that i was not explained how you know the market economy works how how investment works and once you get it you you really can 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 use it to your advantage in a really um good way right and 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 i think if you start investing early if you save just a little bit of money and you invest it well by your 30s there's a good chance you have enough money to fall back on. And then you can take those risks. But if you don't save up anything and you spend all of your money on Starbucks coffee and I don't know what, like, you know, vi um, video games you won't play and who knows what, like things that you just don't really, really need, um, you know, you don't notice it in the moment, but 10 years later, this can be a difference between taking a shot or not taking a shot at something, right? Like, so I really 
would encourage everybody from a very young age, as early as you can, work as hard as you can um, while you're still young, while you physically can do that, learn as much as you can, save up, invest. And when the time is right, when you have some money saved up so you can, you know, you can uh, allow taking a risk without destroying your life, basically, do it. And then you'll feel much better taking that risk and being all in because it kind of, I feel like you kind of have to be all in if you really want to make it work. You kind of being kind of lukewarm and in between, I don't think it quite works, you know, and, and especially if you're in a leadership position and you, um, and you have to have people rely on you. I think they want to see that you're all in because they want to be part of the success. They want to trust you that it's going to work out. So you have to be all in. And for that, you need to have something saved up. I didn't have it, um, but but it worked out. So now I can share the story and say, look, even though it worked out for me, don't do that. Um, do pay attention to uh, saving some some money and investing it well. I like the dose of reality that you bring to this advice. And this is specifically because we were talking about a survivorship bias, right? If you talk to a lot of the founders that were successful, they often will say, oh, of course, the recipe is like these seven things that I have done. And here you are saying that like this very well could have not worked out. Like there is no secret sauce in sense other than I pushed forward for something I believed in. Yep. You take a shot, you, 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 you work really hard, you try as, as hard as you can and you hope for the best, right? Like ultimately, I think in a way also people learn a lot more from failure than they learn from success. Sometimes, you know, you don't appreciate the environment and the variables that just worked out in your favor, you know, the stars that have aligned and you just take it for granted. And, you know, maybe at some point you think you're too special um, and we're all special to some degree, but we also, you know, we also have to stay humble and, and grounded and understand that, you know, this is, this is hard and there's a very high probability of not making it. Even if you're very smart, very hardworking, um, it's still very, very hard. Um, and you have to be humble and acknowledge that and basically get into the uh if you're starting a business right if you're if you're trying this thing try to try to keep your um your feet on the ground basically you know try to understand you know and be grateful you know if things work out be grateful um and don't just uh you know don't use that success to boost your own you know um sense of worth or or something, even though I think that you deserve a pat on the back and you deserve to celebrate successes, but also just acknowledge that, you know, there's a lot of other people that, that, that have uh, helped you get there. And that to some degree, um, it's not luck necessarily, right? Let's call it circumstance. You know, there are circumstantial things that could have swayed the outcome in any direction, you know, like I'm sure there's so many people that almost get there and then something happens and it just doesn't quite get there. Right. And, uh, and it's hard to, it's hard to look back and see that if you've always succeeded, right. If you've never, um, uh, never failed. And this is the thing I worry about a little bit because, you know, we've also succeeded with Ori2 and we've never really failed in a big time, you know, and, and I think I worry about that a little bit. Not that I want us to fail, but that I want us to not become, um, you know, complacent and and uh, kind of like not really see the reality that you know that this that, that these things can fail easily, and you sometimes are cutting it much closer than you think. So I um, I try to stay grounded in in sort of like analyzing things and and worrying about what ifs and uh, and being more uh, more pragmatic about our projections. But we also have learned a lot and we failed, like we haven't failed in a way where, you know, we've did, done a project and it didn't ship or it, shipped, it didn't ship in a, you know, in a good state. Um, even though Ori 2 had some performance issues, uh, day one that, that we had to sacrifice for the for the sake of shipping it on time and and prioritize, we've prioritized the, the creative excellence over the technical excellence. And that's the, probably the right trade-off, even though I, you know, I would love not to have done that if we could. I think... We have learned, and if we, you know, we we look more on a kind of like detail level, I do think there's been a lot of failures there, you know, and um, you know, we're I think we've we've incorporated a lot of learnings, a lot, and we are still learning. I think we're failing to this day. If we're honest to ourselves, you know, and we just we just have to look at what are we doing wrong all the time and try to do better, try to fix it, try to you know outdo yourself and um, and eat some humble pie once in a while and admit that 
you know what, you don't know everything and you, you have a lot to learn still. We're still very young, you know, and, uh, and keep going, you know, and keep going. I think that's also partly why this job is, uh, evergreen, if you will, right? Like it's never like, okay, you're basically in the same spot. You're always learning and improving and you're growing and your team is not the same as it was two years ago. Your process, your, your, how you do things is not the same as it was two years ago. You know, you're, you're improving and day to day, you might not see that but if you look in you know one year back two years back you can really see how far you've come on all of these things so it's i i I think i'm a very i'm kind of like an optimizer by nature i like to optimize things and get them to you know really the the utmost efficiency and 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 perfect things and uh it's like a garden right that you really kind of like allow it to grow and you 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 know you groom it and you do the right investments so that in the spring you'll have beautiful flowers but you cannot see them now, but you have to think about, you know, it's, it's going to be there. It's going to grow. And uh, I like the garden analogy a lot. Um, I like gardens for some reason myself. So maybe that's why I, I gravitate to that. But yeah, I guess um, it's a long way of saying that, that you, have to, um, you have to believe in what you're doing, but you also have to stay grounded and you have to be willing to be self-critical and you have to be willing to eat crow and humble pie and 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 be willing to say look we messed up here we have to do better and uh and do it and and i think then you know you really can unlock that next level which is um it's genuine you know it's genuine growth it's genuine growth for yourself it's genuine growth for the studio and i think it's contagious it's how you build trust with people you know people when they see that you can really uh, be genuine about your own mistakes and and your own growth. Um, they trust you. They trust you that you're not, you know, selling them, uh, you know, rosy-eyed uh, glasses kind of tinted uh, reality. And you're telling them buzzwords. And and you you know, we always thought at Moon that we would, that, you know, maybe it goes back to your question: Why did we start Moon Studios? We didn't like how things were done in big companies. You know, we we all worked at big corporations and bigger studios, and there's a lot of politics and a lot of just just things that we are like, why do you have to deal with that? You know, it's like, you're trying to go from A to B and you do this, right? Like you, this is like a zigzag path because, you know, there's so many weird dynamics that, that, that you have to deal with. Um, and we've learned that it's much better to be just the shortest, the shortest path is, is a straight line and you just stay true, stay, stay, um, you know, stay honest and never try to like, play any games or lie or do politics or whatever, because ultimately I think life is too short for that stuff. And it never really truly works, right? You know, it never really works to kind of like not be honest and to be disingenuous about things or whatever, just stay true to your values, be honest about it. Don't apologize for it, but, but, um, but also be humble about it and be willing to learn and change and, and get better. This is a very valuable perspective, especially coming from somebody that is a founder because Again, from my perspective, anybody that starts a company, starts a studio, you have to combine this both humbleness and then also a multitude of different skills. You kind of alluded to with things like prioritization, right? Like we have the kind of we take priority on the kind of the creative direction over the technical direction for some things. How do you personally, as again, a founder, combine those to make sure that your studio runs like a well-oiled machine to make sure that you're producing the right outputs the right products for the customers that uh you're serving i think for me it's very natural because like i just i just love both and i always like to think about how these two things kind of feed into into one another um so maybe it's a bit of an intuitive question for me because i i do it intuitively but then i need to think about how we how we really combine it i think it helps that in a way thomas and i are kind of like balancing each other in a way where Thomas is more of a creative head and I am more of a, let's say production, you know, technology person. And, and even though I, I have a strong affinity for art visuals, especially, and, uh, and I, and I had my contributions there, I am much more predominantly occupied with how we do things, making the technical aspects be really, really, really good. And, um, and I think we, we kind of like, 
there's this constant push and pull where, you know, we don't allow each other to go out of balance, right? So Thomas is dreaming big and, you know, he, he'd have all the craziest ideas and, you know, he's he'll shoot in all kinds of directions. And then I would probably bring sometimes some more reality into it and be like, look, you know, let's think about this. Let's use a more pragmatic approach to really prioritize or figure out a way um, in this, right? How are we actually going to go and build this thing? And how are we going to actually um, not only build it, but 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 constantly iterate and course correct in a way where it, it becomes what we want it to become? Um, and uh, and I think it's a good team. Ultimately, you know, we kind of we kind of complete each other in that sense. And also, it helps that you know I have you know the same weight as Thomas. So, you know, in a lot of companies, what happens is that, um, you know, the, the create, the, the, the owners of the studio, they're either coming from a creative background, you know, they're like a creative director or a producer or whatever, or they are uh, technical people, you know, they're very, very technical. And it, it's like a lopsided balance of power because, you know, if, if the guy that's running the studio, or, um, you know, the person, a girl that running the studio, they are, um, they are only seeing this one part of the picture, then they kind of color everything with that perspective, right? Like, so a technical person would kind of run everything and override everybody in that technical way. And then the creative person would be much more of a creative uh, perspective and it would kind of like trickle down and, uh, you know, go through the entire studio. Um, but the, the fact that we kind of both um, oppose each other in the right way, right? Um, and kind of balance each other. I think that 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 helps combine these two. What do you think are the other skills that you kind of brought to the table that helped you drive Moon Studios to what it is today? In addition to what we talked about, kind of the technical acumen. I think I just, uh, well, there's, there's probably, you know, there's probably a lot of small things, but generally I think I'm kind of very, hard to i don't like hearing no in a sense where i like when people tell me it cannot be done this is where i get excited this is where like okay i don't believe it it probably can be done let's really you know like for instance the switch port for or in the will of the wisps um people in the team right and also outside of the team said it cannot be done like it, this is not a game that can run on that that hardware Definitely not at 60 frames per second, which is the the, the frame rate that we targeted. And um, it was extremely hard to do it. It was crazy for the team that did it. But I think we we're all extremely proud with the result because it turns out it is possible, right? It, you can do it. And, you know, with Ori 2, uh, sorry, with Ori 1, I remember this big discussion where we said we couldn't do a continuous streaming, right? Where you'd go through the world and we would have these, uh, in the early prototypes, we had these eight bit, bit scroll locks where you would go in, you know, off screen, there would be a fade to black, and then you'd go off in another screen. And we, I really disliked that. And I wanted a more seamless game. I wanted a game where you just never have these fades unless you really have to. And we created the seamless world and we prototyped the, the, the streaming tech, which nobody did at Un in Unity back in the day. Um, with performance, with efficiency. And we, I think we we're one of the first games to really do streaming in Unity with that much art, with that much you know, uh, complexity. And uh, once we had that prototype and we've seen how it works, we were like, this is much better. This is, you know, uh, there's a lot of these things where, where I like to push the boundaries, where I am excited. I am, what excites me is to do something that wasn't done before, to try something that, um, you know, uh, to, to do something that is unconventional, and difficult, right? Um, that that's what excites me to push the boundaries, and maybe I think hopefully that contributed to some um, aspects of success, I guess, of the of the team. So uh, I basically I push everybody to challenge themselves, to ch to challenge the boundaries, uh, to challenge what's accepted. You know, like why are we doing this this way? Well, because we've done it this way at this other company. Okay, maybe we've been doing it wrong at both companies. I don't know. Like, let's really think about it. You know, as uh, some people say, it's this thinking from first principles, this physics-based thinking of like, why are you doing this? Not because you've done it somewhere else by analogy, but really there is a good physical reason. This is the simplest thing you can do, the most common sense thing you can do. So I guess this very pragmatic common sense approach and challenging boundaries and 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 pushing boundaries, I think is is uh, maybe a skill that that um, that I was born with, and uh, th that's what gets me excited in the morning, right? Like that's that's why I'm here, and um, 
I think that probably helped. And I think that actually translated really well into something that I think stood out to me about Ori as a game, as a creative outlet, is just the sheer incredible amount of polish. I have not seen that amount of polish in any of the games that I've played in the past. Like the moment I saw like Ori in the Blind Forest, I was just like, wow, how did they pull this off? Right. For something that you might think from the surface that's like, oh, it's just, you know, a 2D, I don't want to say like platformer, but basically you jump around, right? But just the 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 sheer amount of attention to every little detail. How did you pull that off? I I think again it's a it's an obsession, right? Like what we would do uh towards the end of the project and uh even during the project is just constantly play the game. Like few hours every day just play the game all the time all the time and then we would we would record ourselves play and whenever there would be something that isn't right we would clip that video of our of us playing and we would talk over it or paint over it or whatever and say this visual effect could be better there is this janky camera pop there is this transition in the animation that doesn't quite feel smooth there is this little lighting thing that feels off there is this composition that feels too messy and maybe we can open it up you know there is uh this an environmental animation opportunity that we're not utilizing like we could add a bit more swaying grass here so that it feels more interactive and more animated you know just like billions and billions and billions of small things that you just you know, I think uh, we and I personally like we would open like hundred to two hundred bugs every day on polish, just like constantly feeding this process of just make it better, make it better, plus it, plus it, plus it. And at some point, you know, it becomes greater than the sum of its parts. You know, you polish it, you polish it, you polish it uh, through this highly iterative process, and it becomes this quality. You know, it's like polishing a shoe or polishing a piece of metal, right? At some point, you know, it's scratchy and at some point it becomes super, super smooth and beautiful. And I think that's a little bit of the same thing. You just scratch it. But the analogy of opening bugs and, and having people work work them off, I guess, it's it's a very simple concept. But I don't think a lot of people apply it because, quite honestly, not everybody cares about this much polish. I just immediately, like, if I don't feel control of vibration or camera shakes or, you know, there's animation pops, like, whatever, it drives me crazy, personally. Like, I, I want that to feel good. Um, and I think Thomas is the same way and everybody we hire are the same way. We, we obsess over over the feel of the game and how it, how it really, you know, how it really feels in your hands. Um, so it's a culture you train, you know, the people, you hire people that share that, you know, that sense of, uh, you know, attention to detail. And it's also the process and the ability to carve that time in the schedule and fight for the time in the schedule to allow the game to really get baked to that level, which I think not everybody, some people, sometimes people just go, look, we've spent X amount of money. It's good enough. It's going to sell the same amount of units, um, you know, go and sell it. But this is not who we are. You know, we're not here to spend three or four years on a game and then ship it in a half-baked state. In my, in our opinion, a lot of people would say it's you know finished, but we would say no. For for us, it's we can do better and we want to do better. And at some point, you know, you have to let go of your perfectionism and just ship because it will never ship. But uh, we are still you know always finding that fighting that balance, like how much polish is too much polish, and at which point do you do you stop? But I think that's the DNA of the studio is just really um, take things to that level where they are exceptional. I think what you're describing is basically focus on the craft. That not a lot of folks, especially, again, in the engineering right now, because it's so ubiquitous, there is kind of the pressure to just ship, 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 ship. And you end up shipping sometimes things that are like, uh, we just needed to get it out the door. Um, but your studio focuses on craft. So I, I really, really like that. I really appreciate the perspective. Now, all this being said, this was a jam-packed episode, I think, of a lot, a lot of... Very important wisdom, right? It's absolutely helpful. It's helpful for me. I'll be very honest. But if you think about one unconventional piece of advice for someone that once, you know, they listen to this, they want to follow in your footsteps, what would that be? Yeah, I have something for you, Pro probably unconventional. And I have to preface this with, um, you know, look, this is just my perspective. It's just one crazy guy on the internet you're listening to. You know, it worked for me and it was important to me. I'm not a doctor right? Like, um, do your own research, ask your doctor, do everything. Like, I don't take any responsibility for you taking the advice I'm going to give you. But I think what people 
do not talk about um, for some reason. And I wish I've, I, I'd, I'd heard this advice way earlier in my life is everybody talks about how to build a game, right? Like how to manage a studio, how to do business, blah, 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 blah. But nobody talks about, well, how do you survive that yourself? You know, how do you deal with the enormous amount of pressure and hard work, long hours, you know, and um, how do you balance yourself physically and mentally? Because I think it's really important, especially for founders and managers to be balanced themselves so that they can help other people in the team find that balance as well. I mean, this industry is very much known for people that work really, really hard. I mean, obviously, the the, the, the C-worth crunch is something that uh, is a big debate, and it should be. And it is a problem, you know, and has been a problem for many of us. I mean, we all started much, much earlier, and we've all done our share of... I mean, I came from feature film, and it wasn't much different, you know. Um, it was just as bad. You know, the director would come in at 9 p.m., they would do a review, and there would be some presentation and you know you'd need to stay up uh, much later to finish whatever the next revision the director wants just so they can show something um you know this is this is not the only industry and i think we've gotten better as an industry uh at crunch but it's not really about crunch you know it's not it's not about it's not necessarily about the working hours it's not necessarily about that it's really the physical and mental stress of the job right like you can work 8 hours a day but you can be so stressed that you wish you worked, you know, uh, or you could be working 12 and you, you're fairly chill and maybe that you don't feel it at all, right? So I think there is something to be said about everybody finding their own way to it and, and a balance where, um, for me, what I found is that I really have to prioritize my health, that I haven't done that for many, many years. You know, I got away with murder, you know, I would sleep very little, I'd abuse caffeine, you know, I'd, I'd do things that I really know today that they're pretty horrible to do to yourself both mentally and physically. And I think that um, if there's one piece of advice, I would say get really passionate about your health, you know, and not in a selfish way, right? There is this, I always give this analogy because I think this is how it works in my head. You know how on an airplane flight, they always tell you, you have to put your oxygen mask first before you help others. I think it's the same here. It's like, if you're not balanced, if you're stressed out, if you're, you know, hysterical about things, if you cannot handle the pressure or you just burnt out or, or whatever, if you cannot handle your own thing, how can you help others, right? Like if you want to be able to help others and be a good partner, um, uh, be a good, uh, you know, father, uh, be a good uh, professional, you have to take care of your body because ultimately that's all you've got. You know, when everything is said and done, um, that's the only thing you have left. So I'd really say get into um, cardio. I, I really prefer running these days. I tried everything. And, you know, people think, you know, you have to run to um, to be, to lose weight, to look better. Don't care. Like, be, you know, be overweight, but run. You know, the, ba the main thing is the, 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 the ability of your body to get oxygen into your system, to, 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 to have blood going into your system. Um, it's a life-changing experience. I wish I've discovered this. And everybody told me, if you, if you do strength training, you know, your, your blood goes up, you don't need to do cardio. That's not true. It wasn't true for me. Um, you need to do both. You need to do strength training and you need to do, um, uh, to do cardio. Those two things are essential for mental health. People do not realize, like, if I have a really difficult day, um, I go for a run, you know, and then that fixes everything. It's like a, it's like a cleanse, you know, it's like a, a thing. And, 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 you know, I don't know of a substance or a pill that achieves the same effect, especially consistently over time. And people these days, they're so used to like, hey, I go to a doctor, prescribe me this, prescribe me that. Like it's, it's a one button solution. People look for shortcuts, but there are no shortcuts in business. There are no shortcuts in creating exceptional products in, in, in succeeding um, at whatever you're trying to do in life. But there are also no shortcuts in, in maintaining good health over time, especially, you know, if you want to ideally, you know, maintain high performance, you want to feel good um, into your, you know, 40s and 50s. Um, with the amount of stress that we do, uh, we, we, you know, as founders, I think, especially as entrepreneurs, um, nobody talks about this. And I don't know why. Like, why don't people just open up about, this is really freaking hard. You know, this is really, really hard. It's extremely stressful. There's so much responsibility, um, so many, um, you know, a long hours, but it's not even about the hours. It's just the sheer constant stress. You go to sleep, you keep worrying about things that are about to happen tomorrow, right? Like 
Um, there is like a billion things to get that you need to get right for a studio to 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 thrive and function. So um, take care of yourself. Uh, get passionate about it. I can you know really recommend supplements as well. You know vitamins, CBD oil, things like that. Um, definitely cardio and strength training. Cardio for oxygen to get into your brain so that you can function best and sleep best and 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 uh get the stress out of your system to to maintain uh a good uh you know uh, a good nervous tone to, so to speak and the 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 le- strength training is for maintaining your hormones and to to have healthy hormones and he- healthy um a muscle mass in your body so that you can also feel good and you can you can function well some people think that you know by working more you know, you can, uh, you, you, your brain just gets better at that. And it's true. But at some point, if you neglect the blood flow to your brain, if you neglect your just basic biology, your brain is nothing else but biology and it's connected to your body. And, you know, and the problem with all of this is that you don't notice this because it's a gradual deterioration. You know, your state, it's not like you wake up, well, sometimes it is, you know, if something drastic happens to your health, but usually it's a very slow, gradual process of losing, you know, the colors aren't as bright, the emotions are, aren't as strong, the energy is not as high. And, you know, and, and people that want to have more energy do cardio because, you know, this is how you train your mitochondria. This is the, the core energy mechanism by which your body has energy. And sorry, there's nothing else you can do about it. You know, you can get, you know, a lot of coffee, but at some point you're going to sleep badly. Uh, your sleep quality is going to suffer and your sleep is the foundation of your health, you know? So I really recommend sleep, supplements, exercise, and fasting. I think fasting for me has been also another big revelation where I, again, do your re- own research. This is what what helped me. I, I don't know if it's going to help you, but but do check it out. Um, it made my schedule so much more flexible, just knowing that I don't have to stuff myself with food all the time, that I don't have to be hungry. I'm not controlled by food anymore. I control when I want to eat and uh, and I feel so much better. Um, I have so much more energy and uh, I feel I feel healthier in my, uh, you know, close to my 40s now uh, than, I, than I was when I was very unhealthy and crunching and, and doing crazy things. Um, so again, like, Keeping your balance is super important. And we work on that with our studio as well, with our team. We want everybody to have a really good balance in their life so that they can be happy in their life and they can ha- be happy at the company and they can um, they can have longevity because we don't want this thing where people go in, you know, they work really hard for two years and they're gone. We want people to stick around for the long haul. Um, and I think taking care of your personal health is, is a fundamental pillar that, um, that I wish... I wish somebody would have told me this when I when I when I was younger. Um, so I hope this is unconventional and and maybe maybe useful to somebody. This is extremely useful, and I'd say this is probably the most unconventional advice we've ever heard on the show. Gennady, thank you so much for sharing your story and insights. This is uh, fantastic. Is not a it, it doesn't even cover everything that we just discussed. So thank you. This is really my pleasure. I. I'm really happy to be able to just have a chat and uh, give back and hopefully say something that is useful to somebody maybe in my shoes uh, or the shoes that I was, you know, 12, 13 years ago. I, I love to share it maybe to hear what I wanted to hear back then. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you.